All right, everybody. I would love for somebody who is here already to just confirm in these, the little chat window on your bottom right, if you can see or hear me, Alice is gonna be joining us very, very quickly. Hi, Irene, hi, Leigh. Or Lee, sorry. Tracy, um, so today can see, perfect. Um, we have one more person joining us. That would be the wonderful Alice Kuypers. She is off grabbing a drink of water and getting uh, ready. We should be good to go as soon as she gets back. But uh, since people are here already, I wanted to get on, introduce the webinar a little bit, uh, and get started. I'm really excited about these interview webinars that I've been doing. This is my second one. The first one I did was with Becca Ansari. That went really well, and I think that we had some really interesting conversations. So she is a debut middle grade author. And we ended up talking about craft, we ended up talking about marketing. So very exciting stuff. Um, with Alice, it'll be a slightly different ball of wax because she is a multi-published author, writes in all sorts of different categories. And so we'll really be talking about sort of life, art, business balance and uh hi ann from vancouver and we will be talking about sort of alice is also a craft teacher she teaches the middle grade young adult and uh i believe chapter book blueprints of, uh on writing blueprints i have the manuscript submission blueprint with that platform that's actually how alice and i met and forged our friendship um so she's also a writing teacher. And so I I think the craft insights will be very, very valuable here. And I'm just really excited to get started. So she'll join us in a few minutes. I am gonna start with some uh, housekeeping for these webinars because we still have a few minutes to go. So you will see zoop, it for you. <laughs> I have to remember that it's opposite. So for you on your bottom right uh, part of the screen, That'll be a chat box. Uh, a couple of people have already found the chat box. I am not going to be monitoring the chat box necessarily a ton because I'm going to be sort of uh, running the webinar and keeping my focus on our guest today. Um, as you will see, though, I have copied and pasted a little spiel in the chat box um, because I can't do tech support while the webinar is running necessarily. There's not very much for me to do, unfortunately. So if anybody is uh, experiencing any technical difficulties, my recommendation is use the Chrome browser, use the Firefox browser, those tend to be the best. Try to do it on a laptop or computer rather than a phone or a tablet. Those, uh, those tend to sometimes be a little glitchy. I've only heard reports of a couple of technical issues, but I wanna make sure that everybody feels taken care of. Um, the best news is the webinar is gonna be recorded. And so you are not missing anything. If your audio cuts out, if you have to go early, if anything happens, you will get an emailed version of the webinar after, after we finish and I stop the webinar, then it'll be distributed a couple hours later today to everyone that is registered. And so you can watch it, rewatch it as many times on demand as you'd like. So if anything happens, if you have a technical issue, you can always come back to it. There's no, there's no need to, um, to stress out about it in the moment. But in my experience, Chrome has worked well, Safari works well. I've sort of given a few tips at the top of the chat box. That'll be kind of the limit of uh, what I'm able to do from a tech perspective in that chat. Um, let me walk through a couple other features of this webinar. Um, if you scroll down below the screen where I appear and where Alice will soon appear, you will see three little areas, questions, polls, and offers. Questions is where I would really love to see you write your questions for Alice or for myself. We will take some time at the very end of the webinar to field some of those questions. So that's where your questions should go because it's easier for me to find them there than scrolling through the chat box. Um, on one note, all of the questions and the chats are being recorded as well for the recording of the webinar. So don't put anything in there that you wouldn't want recorded. Uh, for everyone else to see. I also have a little poll here. Um, 
And I just, that's just for fun, out of curiosity, I want to know what everybody here is writing. So we have middle grade, young adult, chapter book, picture book, and other as your options. And then finally, ooh, ooh, middle grade and picture book, checking in. Um, finally, uh, the offers tab is how I am able to post links. So I have three links posted for you today. One is, ooh, uh, we have, so Alice is going to be phoning in from our neighbor to the north. Uh, Saskatoon is where she is based. And so we have some, uh, Vancouver, uh, we have two British Columbia uh, people checking into the chat. So that's always exciting. Um, in the offers tab, you will see a link to my editorial services. That's my, my website for editing and consulting work. I offer all of my webinar students a $50 discount on uh, any services over 400 bucks. If you are interested in a service, please mention that you're a student of this webinar. And I would be happy to talk to you about any kind of editing that I do. Um, I also have a link to Alice's website. You can go there and learn more about her work. And then finally, I love feedback on these webinars. I listen to it. I read all of the things submitted there. And so if you have a chance uh, during or after the webinar, you will see a link to the feedback form there. This will also go out via email to you after the webinar. So don't worry about hitting that link right now if you don't feel ready to leave some feedback, you'll always have it in email. So um, we're just waiting for Alice to join us. And uh, oh, we have another person from British Columbia. Very exciting. And I have to say, uh, I am based in Minneapolis now, and we are having some weather, we're having a big storm out right now. So, oh, and there's Alice. Uh, I was just warning everyone that we're having a big storm. And if my power cuts out for any reason, you're gonna have to run the ship. <laughs> you're gonna have to run the ship. So be ready. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'll see. I'll see how I do. Okay, so I am going to uh, turn Alice up on the big screen. I'm gonna turn myself onto the little screen. And um, so Alice, now that you have joined us, we have this little chat box uh, in the screen I see here, that. Um, and we also have questions. Why don't you okay. not worry about the chat or the questions? I'm going to kind of poke through there and curate anything for you at the end. And then I have okay. obviously some questions of my own. Right. Uh, so Alice is the fabulously talented multi-published author across a lot of different categories. I was, uh, mm -hmm. we have three people who have chimed in from British Columbia. So you have a lot of, uh, fellow Canadian representation. <laughs> Hello, yes. Hello, Canada. <laughs> in the audience. So you're based in Saskatoon. Uh, you have a large family. You uh, do a lot of philanthropic pursuits that are very near and dear to your heart. So you have a very full and active life, and you're also writing for a lot of different categories. So there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on. And one of the books that we'll be talking about specifically, and I wish I had found it, uh, otherwise I would hold it up, uh, because you were so gracious to send me a copy, is Polly Diamond. It's a chapter book series. Ah, there you go. <laughs> you have a cover. There it is. Um, Alice. Well, the reason I the reason I have it is actually this is the new um, paperback, oh, and so uh, twenty copies just arrived uh, yesterday of this one. There's a second book which is in hardcover, but this one just arrived in paperback. So I thought, oh, I could bring one upstairs. Congrats! Yeah. Well, there's if people have questions about more technical aspects of chapter book writing, then then I would there's bits I would look at specifically on the page there that would be helpful. That is fantastic. And I did say while you were gone, um, Alice is also a writing teacher uh, through the Writing Blueprints platform. She has the middle grade and young adult uh, writing blueprint as well as chapter book. Is that it? Or do you have one more? Yeah, that's right. Um, that's yeah, that's right. I uh, We've made those over the last couple of years. And so we've got lots of students who come and do classes there. That's a that's an online space where people uh, can take the videos at their own time and look through the, um, the homeworks, I suppose, or the tasks um, to build their own book at their own pace. So, yeah. yeah, it's a it's a great platform because you get to sort of teach it yourself with expert guidance in the form of videos and handouts. Yeah. 
Um, and Alice has developed uh, some of my favorite programs there. I have the manuscript blueprint one, our manuscript submission blueprint, uh, which is all about yeah. agent research and the submission steps. But for the craft focus, Alice really is uh, at the at the forefront of the chapter book, middle grade and young adult, which is why I'm so excited to have her because she will bring, I hope, a lot of craft insights, no pressure. Uh, anything you guys want to know, basically. I'm here, yeah, I'm here for you. So if there's anything useful that any of you want to know about any aspect of, of writing for children and young adults, then hopefully I can answer your questions and Mary's questions. Oh, but yeah, anything. Yep. Don't, don't, feel like, don't feel like your question is like something that's silly or maybe everybody already knows the answer because most of us don't know all the answers and some of the answers have taken me years to figure out even if it might seem like a silly question uh, and I could save you a lot of time. <laughs> right and even if you think you know part of the answer you might always get some additional insight to flesh out the answer even more. Um, Hopefully. So I have questions and we will leave some time at the end for your questions. For uh, those of us just joining, again, we have a question tab down below where you can type in any questions that develop. All right, so let's dive in. Um, I would love to know, Alice, your authorly back story, how you came to writing and kind of some of your early road, if you could please enlighten us. Sure. So. I have always loved to read, which is where my love of writing, I think, was rooted. Although when when that began, it was really a pure passion for just enjoying being immersed in story. And um, despite the fact I have I have six children I'm responsible for in my household at the moment, um, I still manage to read every day. That's been something that I have always continued, and it's actually my fundamental rule is that I read at least 50 pages every day no matter what um even when I was like having my kids and they were being born um I would still make sure I read 50 pages normally fairly easy books at that stage um and so I loved reading and then as I got a little bit older I had a teacher at school who invited us to write a novel in class when we were 11 so I wrote a whole book and it was I don't know, 30 pages, oh. and I loved doing it. Then I wrote stories and poems, and then by the time I was about 14, 15, I was very busy with uh, boys and parties <laughs> and uh, not really thinking much beyond the moment. And I still wrote, I still read, but I thought I should have like a serious job. Um, so I considered all sorts of things, you know, working in the city or being a lawyer or a politician or uh never really doctor that didn't ever seem feasible um then i went traveling when i was 18 i went traveling by myself uh for nearly a year wow. and um wow. during that time i realized quite quickly that i didn't particularly want to keep a journal i wanted to make stories up and so i invented stories and poems and, and when i came back i went to university i had got a place already before i left to go traveling and while I was at university, I barely showed up for lectures and I spent most of my time working on a novel um, that, that didn't end up being published, but it was important to me. Mm -hmm. And the one other piece in there, I suppose, in terms of journey, when I was about 19, I was traveling again, 20 maybe, uh, and it was just a shorter trip, it was just a two month trip. And I met somebody on a boat who read something I was writing and he turned to me and he said, oh, this seems like a children's story. And I remember being very offended, <laughs> um, wounded that he would think that and that he didn't understand at all. But it's because I was only just barely out of being a child myself. And I didn't understand that all of those books that I had read as a child um, and as a young adult had been the foundation for, for what I was mm. beginning to write then. And that actually writing for children rather than being something to look down upon in any way, which I did when I was 19. I wanted to write a very serious literary novel, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with those. Um, and then as I, as I wrote more and more and more, it became natural for me to write characters who were 13, 14, 15, 16. Um, and then when I started having my own children, I started writing stories that were for younger children. Mm um as well because i was reading so many of them and those characters came to mind so for me it's always been 
the character is the key piece and when I know the age of my character I kind of unlock what type of a story it's going to be okay hello St. Paul and New York I'm enjoying these hellos <laughs> yeah we have people world. joining I I've had people from like Tel Aviv anyway it's it's super fun to see who checks in Good. um so I've been to Tel Aviv I liked it ah, yeah so you have always been writing and you had it seems like pretty serious aspirations to publish you weren't just writing for yourself mm. or no 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 i didn't really think about publishing until i started um so i went after i finished university so i did a degree in psychology okay. and then people kept asking me the very serious question you know what are you going to do yeah. and all i could really think was well whatever i do it can't get in the way of the fact i want to write every day and i want to read every day and uh, so I conjured up jobs that would work around that. Um, and I realized that while I liked writing, I wasn't very good at it um, and that I needed to get better. I didn't have that natural. You know, sometimes you read people's sentences and they just are luminous. It's not the type of writer I am. <laughs> and um, I had to learn how to be a better writer to be able to even begin to tell the stories I wanted to tell. So it felt to me like the best way to do that was to do a master's degree in writing um, whilst working. Uh, so I did a part-time master's degree in creative writing. And during that, um, part of what we had to do was learn how to reach out, like, like you've done with your submission blueprint, learn how to reach out to publishers. Mm. And so that's the, the book I wrote during my degree, which like my master's degree, not my undergraduate degree. So I wrote a book during my undergraduate degree. Uh, and then I wrote a different book mm. during my master's degree, and that's the one I began to submit to publishers. Not successfully, but that, that's where I began to submit. And that's where I started to think more about sending work mm -hmm. out. But I don't know that I ever really started thinking about writing as like, I don't, well, suddenly it was my job. Yeah. Um, I had wanted to publish, but I had always assumed I would have to do other stuff too, and then in uh, in 2007 when i published my first ya book um life on the refrigerator door suddenly it became clear that i didn't have to do other jobs as much anymore i would be able to focus like suddenly i was a, a, a writer uh, just because that book did so well oh that's great so it really was sort of a process of you wanted to refine your craft first then pivot toward yeah. wanting to publish and okay yeah. and and then just just as a just as a final yeah. piece in that story life on the refrigerator door wasn't the first book yeah. it was the seventh seventh book i think seventh. I wrote. so wow yeah seven books and for every book i publish now there's another book that i write as a companion that i do not publish so publication is not my focus <laughs> yeah i'm um, sorry yeah. i you've read you've read one of them the, the, it's just it's sitting just there. The, nobody else has seen it. Yeah, it's just a, just the other Tell book. Tell me why. Tell me why a com so you <laughs> call it a companion. It's not a very practical process. I don't recommend it to anybody else. But for me, it takes any pressure off um, feeling like I'm in that second stage where I'm wondering about you know whether the book passes muster uh, and that second stage process of writing where you're really figuring out the editorial side. I sort of push it away by working on two books because I really don't know which is the one I'm going to edit. That is so fascinating. I would love so yeah. okay. So now I don't think I've met anybody else who does it like yeah. this. So And you don't recommend it. <laughs> no. It's not a very no, it's pretty slow. It means I've written loads of books. Um lots of them, lots of them, not even one other person has seen. So you have seen one of them. And sometimes I think those books are going to work and sometimes I go back to them later on after their companion book has been published, yeah. but not, not that often. That is really fascinating. Uh, one of the things that I talk to people a lot about is what's next? What's the next step that you take? You have a manuscript, should you start working on something else or should you put all of your effort into the manuscript at hand? And how do you generate new ideas and all of that? And one of the things that I tell people and that you might be a more extreme case, but I, I like to say, don't cling. Don't be precious about the thing in front of you necessarily because you never know how it's going to play out, where it's going to go. The best sort of proactive position is to have multiple ideas in the pipeline, to be working on multiple projects. Yeah. 
I think it's difficult because I think there's different types of writers. So I think there are some writers who that that type of advice would mm -hmm. appeal to. And there's probably some of you right here right now listening who would really get that and who would say, oh, yeah, totally. I can work on three projects at once and that suits me really well. And I find often writers for children and young adults suit that quite well. Uh, although not always. And then there are some writers who would be simply appalled. Like, frankly, it just couldn't ever work for it them to work like that. Well sometimes um, that advice. No, because it isn't, it isn't ever going to be their process. They can only work on one book at a time. And that may be that they have to walk away for a few months and go back to that book or just let it tinker and play in their mind. And actually, it's not possible to work on on two or three projects. And when I meet writers like that, they are... Um, I'd say overwhelmed when they meet me and hear about how I do it because they feel like that like it seems like a lot of work to them to do it that way around but to me it's just how I write you know yeah. um like like you may have a particular cake recipe that you that appeals to you or a certain way you mow your lawn or it, it's just how I do it and it's uh satisfying to me um, but it's not necessarily the process that would work for someone else. So what I would really recommend is not that um, anybody feels too compelled to follow somebody else's process, but people start to naturally trust what their own process is. And yes, there will be long patches where nothing happens. And that might be while you're waiting to hear back from an agent or from a publisher or from an editor, um, or while you just know something's not working with the book, but you don't know how to fix it. For me, I fill up those patches with other projects and I like to work on two and three projects at the same time. But for another writer, that may be the time when they're fallow and during that fallow time, things are happening, but it doesn't look like anything's happening. Because your brain is always working on things creatively on the back burner. Mm -hmm. So walk yeah. me through, and this is why I love doing these interviews, because like you said, not everyone has the same process. And so for writers who are on the journey, sometimes it's very helpful to learn how other people do it. They either pick up something new for themselves that they can use or they they figure out, oh wow, that would never work for me, but it's all it's all grist for the mill, right? So can you walk me through sort of what is the what is the arc for you for a project? It sounds like you're a little, you know, you have a lot of elements going on, but once you get an idea, what what tends to happen for you? So right right now I'm working on a I'm working on a YA book and so I try to write a thousand or so words every day. Um, and I think about the book a lot and I try to keep the outline in mind so I might spend a bit of time every day or so focusing on not a very detailed outline but on like the overall arc. So some of the stuff I talk about in the blueprints is how to create an outline and how to think about how to structure a book. Some of that for me happens um, not so much on the page um, and has to be kind of quietly attended to during the project. I don't know that I would recommend that also. Some people, like particularly starting out, it can be helpful to have an outline and a shape of things. Um, and then, at the same time, I'm reading through a middle grade book that uh, I think is being published next fall. Much to my surprise, they wrote to me and said, can you fill out the author questionnaire, which is a really interesting thing. So fill out the author questionnaire, and I can tell, tell people about those in a minute, the author questionnaire for uh, fall 2020. And so the book is, I guess, being published in fall 2020. And I was thinking, well, I'm still writing this book, uh, so I need to probably hurry up. But the book is, in the process basically where it's pretty much done i just need to read it through one more time so as a second bit of work if i have time i would spend time reading through a chapter or two every day just as like a final read through piece so those that would be how i would be working right now that's what i'm working on now people should know it's summer in saskatchewan uh that means summer holidays my children have been on summer holidays for three weeks already um, I don't know if any of you heard, one of them just came into the room just now. Like it's, it's a bit of a juggle. <laughs> I was, one of my questions yeah. for you is about this kind of work life balance that everybody likes to talk about mm -hmm. just, just in practical terms. But I, so let's, let's finish up on, on the craft. Um, so right now you're doing something very creative with your work in progress, and then you're doing maybe more logistical stuff 
gearing up to uh, to support the book that's coming out in fall 2020, you know, finish it and then support it with the author questionnaire and all of that. You are a multi-published author, so you have books in the world, you have books mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm having a little trouble hearing the question, Mary. The sound has suddenly cut out. Can anyone just type the question into the question box for me? Because I can see the question box, but I can't hear you, Mary. All your sound has just gone. No, Mary, we've lost lost all sound at your end. Oh, there's there's kind of trickles of it. <laughs> can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Okay, well, why don't one of you, while Mary figures that out, um, why don't you guys ask me a question uh, in the chat box? Anyone? <laughs> or I can tell you what an author questionnaire is too, because they're kind of very tedious thing that I have to do nowadays. Um, I'll tell you about that while I wait to see if anyone has a question. Um, so um, an author questionnaire, is a thing that the publisher sends you, uh, which you have to fill out, um, answering all sorts of questions about um, who you are and who you know in the media, if you know anybody, not that I do, um, and um, what you've published before, if you've published anything, and if you've won any awards, and um, what the publisher then does is uses that questionnaire to help create their online and catalog copy for you. And so catalog copy is what appears in the catalog that the, um, the in the catalog that the um, that the publisher would put out. So catalog copy is a short piece of text that would describe your book and a little bit maybe about you. So uh, I have two questions that have come. Hi, Charlene. Hi, Lee. Um, is it difficult for me to switch ages while writing? I also write most of all kidlit ages. Thank you. Um, so I like a lot that I have grown more comfortable and confident with the different age groups. Um, and so it has become less difficult when I start with an idea to see which age group that idea should be for. So when I first started out uh, writing for more than one age group, it took me a while, particularly with the younger age groups, to really understand, okay, this is actually a picture book or this is a chapter book. Um, and that has come with a lot of practice and a lot of reading. Now for me, it happens fairly clearly. I start to see a character I start to have the glimmers of a question and an idea and maybe a title and it becomes much easier for me to see, okay, this would be a book for this age group. And then I have this kind of other questions that happen for me that are questions like, okay, am I working on another book for that age group at the moment? Should I just put this in an idea box? Um, am I uh, wanting to spend time on a book for that age group at the moment like does it excite me um or do i want to focus more on this age group so i look a little bit now in a career sense at it too um is this just going to be totally for fun and for me or is this a book that's likely to be sent to my agent and to my publisher um which would be the right publisher so i have a few of those questions and then i try and shut those all up uh because i don't find those very helpful in the writing process and so it's difficult in a different way because because suddenly i am an author who has books published um i have that kind of publication push which is probably why i would then normally carry on with the idea but carry on with it in a this is a very fun project uh it's never going to be published i won't think about it and so i push the age group piece out of the question and I just see where the story goes and then after I've written a draft I might pull that question back in okay is it the age group I originally thought do I now want to take those questions of whether this is the right thing for me to work on now the right thing for me to publish the right thing for me to send out and my agent helps me with that too and so the other question was about how I got an agent I submitted to loads and loads of agents I got lots of no's and eventually um, through contacts I met an agent in person and uh, she took me on which was lucky can can we hear you now Mary 
Mm, is there ways for you to write your questions and post them for us? Or do other people have questions who are here? Can you maybe hear me now? Oh, now I can hear oh, you, really? yeah. Can other people hear Mary? Oh, perfect. Yeah, so actually it's perfect that uh, somebody, it must have been the, earbud, the earbuds, uh, it's perfect that somebody was asking you about the different age groups. That was definitely going to be one of my, one of my conversation pieces for you because you write picture book with the Violet and Victor series, which is illustrated by Bethany Mergia, who is actually one of my clients when I was an agent. So when I saw you collaborating with her, I was just over the moon. I'm so happy. Aren't they beautiful? The, the books, books are so beautiful. So beautiful. It's such a good job. Yeah. The, they're, they're gorgeous. Um, so you have the Violet and Victor picture book series. You have uh, Polly Diamond, the chapter book series that we were talking about at the very beginning. You have a lot of YA. So what you're what I heard you saying when I came back was you sort of put that question aside in terms mm -hmm. of determining the the final age group. Um, do, does the decision about age group, whether it comes early or later in the process, how does it inform the way that you write and what you keep in mind as you're working on those ideas? Because I would imagine you have to tune them toward the target age group at some point. I think it really happens for me at the beginning. So just as the idea is surfacing and I'm thinking, where does this book belong? And then I really do keep that quiet whilst I'm really focusing on the story. You know, are these characters clear and real? Um, I mean, there's certain conventions, you know, if you're writing a picture book, you wouldn't necessarily want to have like 12 characters, but if you're writing YA, that might be more possible. So there's certain things that when I make those early decisions that come more naturally to me now because I know those conventions really well. And again, that comes from reading a lot and knowing what's out there. Um, so obviously there's ways to break the rule, but if I know I'm likely writing a picture book, then those conventions quietly play in the background for me. So what are the things I would be thinking about and looking for then? Like 32 pages, less than a thousand words, uh, real focus on language and rhythm and out loud. Um, accessibility as the book is read out loud. If I've got a chapter book, okay, my length is six to 12,000 words. I need to make sure again that it's character driven, um, but also I need to think about high action, no subplots, no extra confusions for kids. And I'm really thinking about the fact a kid is gonna be reading these for the first time to themselves. So this is the accomplishment of a chapter book. The chapter book's whole purpose in being is to make a child feel like an accomplished reader on their own. Not that they can't be read by adults to children, but their job is really for readers who are beginning to explore books on their own. And so all of those pieces are in my mind. If I'm thinking about middle grade, I'm thinking about people who are finding out about the world outside of their home. So I'm thinking about how those kids are relating with other kids, with school and less really about what's happening in their families and more really about what's happening in in society for them and then with YA there's this piece about identity you know you're looking at who you are in the world like how do you fit into the world that you have come to understand during your middle years so I'm thinking about what kids are going through in those phases and what is interesting as readers and and convention and length and chapter length but I'm also then stepping back from that and focusing in okay now I've thought about those things I know what those rules are like let's say I'm going to the gym and I'm going to go to play squash. What are the rules of squash? Okay, I'm now in the squash court, but I'm still going to play the game. I'm not thinking about the rules. I'm just playing the game, right? Or, okay, now I'm at the gym. I am going into a spin class. So the rules of the spin class, I know what the parameters are, but I'm not thinking about that while I'm taking the spin class. I'm just in the moment. Uh, to be fair, I don't play squash or go to spin class. Um, but so with each of those conventions, I know the parameters, I've learned them well, I've understood them well, I've read tons of books in each age group. And then I put it all away and I just get on with playing the game. Like I, I, I dive into the book and the story and the characters and I just really enjoy them. And then when I go to edit the book, then those conventions rise back up in me. Okay, whoops. <laughs> I wrote way too many words um, or whoops I have a whole subplot here that needs to go because this is actually a chapter book and it's not super useful although in the main because I know those conventions well those things haven't happened 
too badly, but I would look at it in a more, okay, now I'm a reader, how do I look at this book? What is working, what's not working? Where have I followed convention? Where does it step outside of what suits the age group? And then I'm also at the same time thinking, okay, how does this overall story work? How do these characters work? How does this book come together? And sometimes it doesn't, like the book that you read, I, I just can't fix it. Uh, and that's okay, then I move on to the next thing. Which category, in terms of the, the different age categories that you write, which has been the most challenge? I love, by the way, the breakdown that you just did of these parameters that you keep in mind for each category. Is there is there one that has come least easily for you? And, and why do you think it's it's challenging for you? I don't write as much middle grade, uh, naturally, um, but I don't read it as much either and so I think it's mainly that um, and I probably don't read it as much because my children are just that little bit too young so now my son who is nine just turned ten yesterday um, he's sort of skipped middle grade and gone straight to YA so he didn't really read a lot of middle grade he sort of dived straight into like dystopic YA yeah. so uh, people may disapprove and that's totally fine you're entitled to your opinion but he's actually reading stuff like the Hunger Games quite happily now and didn't really enjoy middle grade either um, so it's not something I know as well although there's some really good middle grade that I have really enjoyed um, and so because I don't tend to read it as much it isn't naturally what I feel um, super happy writing. Um, although um, with these, I guess I have two books coming out this year at the uh, middle grade, um, but they're a very specific thing. They're for a publisher called Orca here in yeah. Canada. Those of you in BC will know Orca. Um, and they publish what are called high-low books. Um, they're actually a really great place for any of you, particularly Canadians, um, who want to who want to really work on on writing um, for that age group. So they, they're they high concept, but low vocabulary, um, technically. And so they're for reluctant readers or people who are reading English as a second language, um, who don't necessarily want to read about tiny fluffy creatures or, you know, going to school for the first time because they've been going to school for years uh they want to be able to read something that's got a high plot but uh and high action and like characters their own age um but they're not a strong a reader so that's the middle grade that i'm doing okay. and i was put in their middle grade category like the 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 outlines and the suggestions so you have to give an outline you have to uh give a very structured outline they edit the outline then they then they commission the book um and those books um i submitted and they, they put them in their middle grade line rather than their YA line. They actually do YA, but they put me with their middle grade stuff and the books I'm writing for them are middle grade. I think to your point about your son reading up into YA or even adult, it is not uncommon for boys, especially at this middle grade time in their development to go up into YA, go up into, into adult sci-fi, fantasy, dystopian, these sort of uh, genre books. And so there's a big push in publishing to write for reluctant readers like you're doing with the Orca books um, and also to engage those boy middle grade readers that are at this point where some boys especially, to generalize, um, either leave reading at this age or they go elsewhere. And so there's a big push in publishing to capture those middle grade boy readers yeah. with maybe higher concept, higher plot, maybe a little bit more accessible vocabulary if there is a reluctance to read and, and develop that slice of the market. Yeah. And so, I mean, and I do think it can be very sensible to think about the market and to, to look at those aspects. I don't do it myself uh, because I, 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 like, I don't, ever really write boy characters um for whatever reason and i don't ever really like i remember when i first started publishing there's lots and lots of vampire books and i don't write about vampires and i feel like it's it's okay also to be quietly happy in what you're doing whilst being realistic like it may be then that what you're doing isn't right for the market right now and then you have to earn money another way too so i've always been capable of doing that as well like I always um keep myself rooted in the practical so you know maybe what I'm writing is just for me and you know that's okay uh or maybe it has somewhere where it can earn me enough for my next book um in which case I don't need to do the other stuff as much so so how do you uh in talking about keeping an eye on the market you do a lot of reading mm -hmm. um 
I always recommend reading uh, for people. I don't understand those writers who are just like, I don't want to pollute my imagination by reading what else is out there. But I think that our peers and the people who have come before us in the craft are the best teachers. They are, you know, you, there's so much you learn when you read actively. How do you uh, choose? So you say, you know, I don't really pay attention to the marketability piece. It doesn't, it doesn't consume your, your process. So how do you choose what to read? Are you, are you just reading whatever is good or are you being more strategic about selecting your reading list? Um, I choose what to read based on like what people tell me to read. I mean, I'm lucky to get to go into lots of school so kids tell me what to read uh if i'm looking for a new kids book um i go into like we have a very good independent bookstore here in saskatoon so i look at what they are um recommending i try and read a lot of local authors i do a thing on the tv here in saskatoon i actually read a lot of adult stuff as well um so i uh yeah, I, uh, I talk about books once a month on the TV here, so I have to be fairly aware of what's what's coming out and what's being published. Um, I find Kindle singularly useless for book recommendations, but nearly always I ask people what they're reading. Um, I find that a lot of other people aren't reading it as much as I feel like I remember them reading, even 10 years ago. Um, I go into bookstores and I talk to bookstore owners uh, and get their recommendations when I'm traveling. Uh, so just in London, just uh, last week, um, there's a nice independent bookstore there. So I went and talked to the bookstore owner there and got some recommendations for him. I read um, The Guardian Weekly and uh, The New Yorker um, and The Atlantic. I feel like The Atlantic, if it does book reviews, I, they don't stay in my head. But The Guardian Weekly and The New Yorker um, have very good book reviews. So does O Magazine. Um, so I always, um, read own magazines book reviews too i always really like those so I, I go to magazines i trust to look for book reviews um to see what to read i ask my publishers what they're reading um i've got like i don't know i don't know how many publishers i have now uh, but i have several i'm very lucky to be working with lots of different publishers so i ask them what they're reading i'll probably ask you um if anyone has recommendations so i try to pay attention um and then um yeah right now i'm reading circe by madeline miller who i really like um i read her song of achilles a number of years ago and uh was very excited to see she had a new book so if it's an author i really like then i will go back to them i i'm not um the sort of person who's snooty with my own reading so i, I read anything and everything i'm not like oh i should be reading something more highbrow or um oh i should be reading more children's stuff i don't i don't really monitor what i'm reading that way it's not a i just i just read a lot like really a lot actually i probably read more than anybody I, i've probably met only two other people in my life who read more than me and they're very very smart and very interesting and seem to have retained a lot more than i do <laughs> guys i can have read a book and then two weeks later i can't remember anything about it so i don't know what's happening with me when i'm reading i don't know that i'm holding on to it i don't think it's making me any smarter um it doesn't seem to stick in my head which is a bit of a shame because if it did i would be very clever um but no it doesn't seem to stay at all sometimes i get halfway through a book and i think oh no i have read that i know what happens but no so it doesn't it doesn't stay but probably because i'm reading a bit too fast but whatever it's it, i like it it gives me pleasure Good, good. Um, so I did want to touch on Polly Diamond. Mm -hmm. That is, that is a project that you're launching a series. The first book just came out in soft cover. Um, can you tell us a little bit about writing a series and writing that series in particular yeah, sure. for those of us who, well, so who might be crafting multiple storylines? Um, so with Polly Diamond, it's interesting actually the question about is it difficult to write for different age groups. Actually Polly Diamond first of all was a picture book and it was completely different. And it was an editor who, who read it and who said, I feel like this should be a chapter book. Um, and so then I went back and the book completely transformed. So the character Polly Diamond in the picture book was writing to the moon about how upset she was about having a new baby brother in the house. Um, and it was called Polly Diamond Writes to the Moon, and it just, it didn't work for whatever reason. And so there was no magic book, and there was no, uh, none of that. And then about a year later, um, I was working in Saskatoon Public Library as writer-in-residence, and the idea came to me that 
that Polly, who had still in my head, might find a book in the library like this that, that she took out that every page was blank and she would write in it because she liked to write. That was always sort of her, her characteristic. And the book would write back to her. And so from there, I started writing graphs. But it took seven years to, to get it into shape. And partly that was because when it was acquired by Chronicle, they said, we would like to see this as a series. You need to change a bunch of things because at the moment, it doesn't work as a series. It works as one book. Um, but there's some pieces you need to put in place that make that world building stronger. And so that was a lot of work. Um, and some of the stuff we had to work on was the character of the magic book that was a bit flat before um, and um, pulling out some of the things that were happening in the first book because it was almost like three books were happening um, and spending a bit more time with each page um, for a reader of the age. So the, the work was quite intensive. And then the second book took maybe a year. And then the third book took six weeks um, because, uh, <laughs> because I know what to do now. Like I know the world. So, it, it came through that process with Chronicle, who have been an amazing publisher and have made beautiful books with glitter. I love Chronicle. There's glitter on the front. Um, I don't know if you can see. <laughs> yeah, on. there's glitter. Even on the paperback, there's glitter. Um, so um, they really did make extraordinarily beautiful books. Um, and um, they took a lot of time with me, which is uh, not always how it goes. Uh, and I learned a lot about what to think about. And some of that knowledge is is latent now. like, And it seems very obvious to me now, but I had to figure it out along the way. So even thinking about the names of the other characters and making sure those are readable. And again, with Orca, with these Hilo books, my editor will write back and she's like, that is not a name that a reluctant reader can read. Well, that's very helpful to transfer over to chapter books. Um, so um, Anna, the sister, was called Aria for a long time. Uh, and then I, my children, when they were reading it aloud to me, they couldn't read the word aria. Like it's actually surprisingly difficult to read that series of letters when you are a reader who's just starting to read. But so even those pieces and then looking at each word, you know, if there's a word that's difficult, how can it be introduced to a character with a character like Polly, who is so confident and comfortable with language and loves to write. Um, so she has to be realistic in her ability with writing. And then, you know, how do you make it that the magic book causes all sorts of chaos, but the book isn't too moralizing? Uh, it's still fun, but Polly still has to fix the problems she's caused, right? So, and she has to do that by writing. So all of those pieces took some time to figure out, but now I feel super happy when they say, okay, you need to write another one. Um, and so they've asked for a fourth one. Uh, I don't know if it will ever end up being published, but at least I get to write it. Um, and whether it gets published or not is is based on how well the books do um, in the market, which I have no control over. So, Got it. And, and so, uh, Bev, I wanted to touch on the rough patch. So in my family, we've had a little bit of grief. And I actually people come to me and they say, oh, I have a grief situation with young children. The rough patch is something I absolutely okay. recommend. So yeah, I I that, yeah. thank you, Beth. I will definitely, definitely read that with my children. Yeah, it's a, it, it's an amazing book. Um, uh, and it looks like Bev is asking, do you give yourself deadlines when writing your books? Mm, not a final deadline. I, well, so I tend to give myself like arbitrary rules and I recommend people have their own rules. Um, but my rules, if these are helpful, are so reading 50 pages a day, although that's really hard with a Kindle. Now I, I feel like it's, I don't know if it's 50 pages anymore. It's just a chunk of time. Um, but 50 pages ish a day. Um, and then I try to, if I'm working on a new book, I try to write about 3000 words a week. And if I'm uh, working on edits, I try to edit three chapters a week. And so I, used to do it by daily um you know this is what i'd like to get done today um but uh, so i have four children who are under the age of 10 and then i also have a 17 year old and then she has a baby um living in my house um and uh it isn't always possible for a day to go the way i think it's going to go like at all and then my editor for polly diamond will um write to me on a friday when i have no childcare, and she'll say can you do your edits by Tuesday next week? And I'm thinking, oh, uh, <laughs> I can't. Uh, I'm going to be up late at night doing those. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I have to be sort of 
flexible. So that's why I give myself a weekly thing. You know, if it's got to Friday and I've got, as I said, no childcare on Fridays um, and I haven't done anywhere near those things. You know, if I've got 2,500 words done, I don't really mind, that's fine. Or if I've only done two chapters, that's fine. But if I've not done anywhere near enough, then I need to start blocking out time in my evenings at the weekends to do my catch up. Um, but normally I manage because I have those buffer days. My um, my eight year old daughter gets bad migraines. So those tend to throw a, a pebble in the works every two weeks, um, much more so for her than for me. Uh, but it does mean yeah. that I can't really do anything until her migraine is, is better. So there's all sorts of pieces, which all of you must understand. Lots of you I'm sure have responsibilities that you're dealing with uh, uh, on a day to day basis. Um, so when it comes to deadlines, those are my kind of weekly things. And then I don't really have an overall deadline when things need to be finished. I mean, when I'm writing books, in the main, they're not commissioned. So the nonfiction YA, um, Always Smile, which I wrote, which came out earlier this year, that were had deadlines. And so then I had to stick to those. So normally what I do, Bev, with deadlines is I actually give myself, if I've got a hard deadline from a publisher, I give myself a deadline of two, maybe even three weeks earlier than that and get it done um because then again i have that buffer zone of if people get sick in my household or if i have to deal with some sort of crisis the book is already there and that gives me extra time to read and reflect um so this orca book um is due at the end of july but i'm not like it's done i just have to finish this read through but to be honest i could send it if i didn't have time to do that read through it would be fine um my deadline is already met so i meet my deadlines i give myself earlier deadlines and then with books that i'm writing uh the like i would finish so so the ya book right now i would finish it my publisher's not sitting there waiting for me to write ya um with those sorts of books uh, nobody really cares when i finish those so i don't make my life hard for myself by adding in more stress but i have a kind of loose sense okay i'll probably be finished by september october which is a sensible time to think about submitting uh because right now is not a great time for me to be submitting work um but my agent would be open probably to receiving the book in september october time probably as i get closer to the end i'll write to her and say i will send you the book by this date and then that will give me an arbitrary deadline what is that working relationship like so <clears throat> can you talk us through conversations you might have with your agent in terms of what kind of category should we aim for next? Uh, who should, because you're working with a number of publishers as well. So not only are you juggling projects, you're juggling different houses. How are, how are these kind of big picture steering career questions decided? And, and what's that process like? Um, well, um, it's an interesting process because, um, because you have to balance the artistic side of it with the practical side of it. And so my agent uh, used to be an editor and is quite good at um, saying, you know, I think this would be something that you might want to work on. And sometimes that lights me up and I feel like working on something like that. But most of the time it just sort of stays quiet, maybe even for a year or two until an idea comes along and I think, oh, that's the idea that works with that suggestion. Now I want to write this book. And then sometimes it's too late for market or publisher or, um, so that's why I've done these commission things recently. So I did this book, Always Smile. I've done these two books with Orca um, because that kind of aligns with uh, okay, this is a fixed project, it's going to take this long, it's those deadlines, and yet at the same time, I can be working on the other books that that are just for me, that I haven't had any kind of career conversation about, um, I'm just enjoying them. So one of the books that I have um, being read by an editor right now is a book for adults. I don't know that that's a great career move, uh, but it's the book I happen to write. Um, and I love it and I'm excited by it and I'm hopeful that an editor wants to work with me more on it because I want to make it a better book. Um, but in terms, of, in terms of my career, writing is so hard to build a career around um, that I think I tend to look at it book to book. Now I'm really lucky, my partner's a writer and he's a successful writer. So um, 
he is able to support me when it doesn't go well for me as a writer. I have been lucky as a writer that I have continued to publish well all the way through. Um, I'm lucky that uh, the, the publishers who've published me have been enthusiastic and they've also been um, kind of the, 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 the sort of publishers who can continue to support my writing life. But then at the same time, I have always had other uh, revenue streams. So I don't feel any sort of panic Mm -hmm. really there's like i mean realistically i'm i'm what you would call a mid-list writer um nobody's heard of me uh and i am able to publish like i i don't know how many books i have coming out maybe four uh in the next year or so two years um and that feels like uh, unbelievable to me but there is no guarantee that i will continue to publish the year after or the year after or the year after that i just absolutely no guarantee so i try and keep my other skills up should i need another job that is, I mean, it can sound scary and intimidating, but I, I really appreciate your perspective there because this, this mid list label that you've applied to yourself is something that a lot of writers hear about. It's something that kind of has maybe somewhat of a negative connotation because a lot of people talk about, oh, I, I have to get out of the mid list. I'm lost in the mid list. Um, I love, but the, I love the mid list. Sorry. I feel I uh, I feel that um, with four children, the mid list is just about perfect. I get to do stuff like occasionally go on tour, uh, which is great, uh, and I get to mainly be home and um, I get to work when I want to work. And so, so for me, like I look, some of my friends are extremely successful. My husband's extremely successful, uh, and I look at their lives and and what that requires, and I feel very thrilled for them and I feel very lucky to get to read their books but I feel genuine delight that the books I write people read them not lots of people but enough people and the people who read them are very generous in their comments somebody writes to me nearly every day to say this book or that book has has connected with me which is a real thrill and pleasure um but uh it it isn't like the admin side of my life, the travel side of my life, the the public um, engagement side is is very pleasant and uh, and very manageable. Like I can fit these things in. You know, I do an interview maybe every week. I do a public engagement maybe every every month, um, and they're always fun. And I feel really lucky to do them. But I, it's not the. I mean, I look at people who are who are full time, um, hugely successful writers, and I think. It, it, I mean, it. It's the sort of life that is extremely um, suited for some people, but it's not necessarily the life to aim for for everybody. Um, and so, I feel like sometimes when we're writing our first book or our sixth book, there's that ambition to be famous and hugely successful. But there's actually a huge amount that comes with that, that requires certain people to be able to, a certain person and a certain ability to live a certain life um, that makes people not necessarily uh, appreciate how hard that is as well. Not that I don't think any of those people are complaining. I think they're very happy with that lifestyle, but it's, it's a lot of work um, to, to maintain and to manage and to fit in that creative enlivening piece whilst you're you know talking to 600 people every night and touring loads and dealing with lots of interviews and dealing with all of those so I feel like mid-list is underrated yeah I, I actually love the wisdom in that perspective because you're you're owning the title of mid-list author you're also owning that you want to have a life and a quality of life that is suited to you. And I think one of the things that could be talked about a lot more in these types of conversations is the idea of fit. Mm -hmm. So not everybody is going to be a fit for this goal of being a famous published author. Not every book is going to be a fit for a certain type of publishing path or a certain category. Like you say, sometimes you find the category 
on the journey a little bit instead of starting out with a big, huge plan to slot this as a chapter book, slot this as a picture book. So I think this idea fit. I, I get a lot of writers who are like, oh, should I publish traditionally? Should I publish independently? And it's like, well, sometimes a different project can have a different fit or a different person can have a different personality type that's a better fit for this or that. And so what I'm really hearing from you is this, this perspective of, you know, I know who I am. I've realized what kind of writer I am. I've realized how I like to write. And, and, and so I sort of keep perspective on that. I don't hold myself to these draconian uh, deadlines for my writing because, you know, I have a real life as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just really interesting to hear how you manage all of these things. Yeah, and I think that everybody has their own answer, you know, their own resonance in that. Um, and I can understand why some people feel deeply dissatisfied by um, where their writing lives are. Um, and I, I get it. Um, and I can understand why people have that ambition and that hunger to publish more, to publish bigger, to publish better. Um, I think what I have learned is that there is some control you have over that. Your control or my control is to write the best book I can by working really hard, um, by reading as much as I can, by knowing um, what is out there in children's books, not because um, that um, would necessarily make me more money, but because it shows a respect for my reader. And so I think I have learned that the whole point of this is actually to respect the fact that a child when they read a book or a young adult when they read a book encounters and touches wonder if you do a good job. And that's the bit that like in the most genuine way is the only reason to do it. And if that excites me still, then then I feel lucky to be able to keep doing it and be paid to do it. Um, and if I'm looking for something else there are certainly easier ways to do those things you know if i'm looking for for um reaching like huge numbers of people or if i'm looking to be famous or to make tons of money there are other ways to write that uh, i think it would be not necessarily easier but that would be a sensible you know a sensible thing to do but I think writing for children and young adults there are so many people out there who are so good who are um, s struggling to make enough money to be able to write their next book um, that uh, I think that it's not the way to go if that's your aim but if your aim is to write a book that touches wonder in a child uh, or a young adult then then you know make sure you can afford to get through the day and uh, and keep doing it um and that's what i did for years and years and years and years and years and that's that's what i keep doing um but i do work really really hard um and uh, a lot of what i do doesn't work and doesn't meet publishers and doesn't end up publishers doesn't end up read and then some of what i do ends up with publishers and uh still doesn't end up read and some of it uh, is published and connects and some of it's done well um, and some of it's done really well and some of it has and that still means that I you know have a very unsure future career um, but I'm doing well enough to have more books coming out um, and some of the other books haven't connected with with as many readers as is needed as determined by marketing to to um, to for so like Violet and Victor, they only did two. Um, they could quite happily have done more, but the books didn't sell well enough, and so so they don't they don't they don't commission a third. Um, but I I can't control those pieces. So the pieces I can't control are the pieces I try to let go of. Thank you. I think that You're writing phenomenal. some lovely messages, by the way, Bev. I'm really enjoying reading your messages. Thank you very much. Um, that's really nice to hear. That's why I do it. <laughs> um, so does does anybody have any? questions as we sort of wrap up our time together. Any other questions that we haven't covered? Um, what I'm hearing here that I really, really admire, and this is just personal uh, glowing about Alice, our guest, is just the hard work and the dignity uh, with 
in which she holds the reader. I think that is just one of the most inspirational parts of writing for children because it's that connection, that idea of relating directly to that reader that might really need to hear exactly what you have to say. It is that mission, uh, which is why I'm glad that you, Alice, ended up writing for kids instead of writing snooty literary fiction for adults like you wanted to when you were fresh out of grad school or whatever the case may have been. Um, and that's, to me, honestly, one of, one of the things that, that is most exciting to me for writing for kids and young adults. One of the things that has driven me to, to this area of the market in my own life. Um, it looks like a lot of people are joining us for the replay. And uh, if no questions come in down in the questions area or in the chat box, I mean, Alice, is there yeah, anything? Yeah, I do want to say one thing. Yeah. So I just, I really strongly think the writing process is a two-stage process. And for me, the first part is really where I write for myself because it makes me feel good and it makes me feel calm. And other people may find that satisfaction in cooking or in playing golf or um, dance or watching TV, like whatever their space is where they have that creative calm right um and i'm guessing for all of you watching this that that for you it's it's writing and it gives you that peace and it gives you that solace and that's when to turn off the ambition and to turn off the worry about which category and to turn off the sound and the noise about what your reader might feel and actually just write for that genuine pleasure and flow and calm that it gives in a in a hectic world turn off your email turn off everything and just write and then the second stage of the process is when you start thinking about the reader and touching wonder and creating joy and finding connection and okay this sentence is way too long or wow this character's a mess or a trope or um how can i make this clearer and cleaner and tighter and better and that's the second stage and i would argue that all of us as writers are better at one stage than the other and so for those of us who are sort of paralyzed by the idea of putting words on the page, you're probably spending too much time in the second stage of the process. And for those of us that um, rush to send work out and are, you know, finish and is done, the second stage is where you need to spend time honing and thinking about your craft. And for those, again, who, who struggle to get words on the page, spending time where you just write without thinking at all, um, without that editorial voice stepping in. Um, learning which part of the process you're stronger at um and and working and honing the other side of it and appreciating where your strengths are and uh, respecting appreciating your own process so listening to how other writers do it and hearing how they do it and then incorporating what is useful testing and trying things out like my husband's a writer he tried um to do some things the way that i do them and some of those things have been useful for him and some have not um and the same the other way around like i uh i have listened and learned as to how he does things and and learned from him and taken on what's useful, but not not worried that my process isn't identical to me. And um, there's a question here about how I schedule interviews and public appearances and things, social medias, do I do much of that? It's easy to get overwhelmed. Yes, it is very easy to get overwhelmed. Um, yeah, I'm on social media uh, quite a bit and I have a newsletter, although I haven't sent it out for a while um, and I have a very nice website. Um, I tend to do those things after I've done my thousand words or my um, or my editorial pieces. So I try and put the writing pieces first. And then if there's time, I might spend an hour or two um, on those bits. Um, in the last year, I've been doing a lot of stuff with two local charities here in Saskatoon. And, uh, and we have all these children, which have been a bit sudden, like we did have four and now we have six. Um, and so I have attended to those aspects less. Um, when I'm scheduling in interviews and public appearances in the main, I actually say no to the requests that I get um, now. But as people starting out in, in writing careers, when I was starting out, I, I couldn't say no. I had to say yes to everything. But I had fewer children, so it was easier. Um, it's a balance piece. I tend to say to myself, when somebody asks me to do something, would I want to do it tomorrow? <laughs> And if I wouldn't want to do it tomorrow, like if I can't fit it in tomorrow, then I can't fit it in in six months time. Like I, I just turned down something for January because I realized that it was just too big of an ask for me. So just recently I got asked to come down to Regina, which is a couple hours south. 
um, to talk about productivity. How am I productive? How do I manage to get everything done? And I realized it would be like a two and a half, three hour drive. And then I would be talking to people for an hour and then it would be a two and a half or three hour drive. And I thought, well, you know, I, I would love to do that, but I wouldn't want to do it tomorrow because I don't have time. So I know that when it comes up, it's just, just going to be too much time and it's actually going to get in the way of me doing stuff. So so I have to say no, much as I would love to do that. And I'm really pleased to be asked. Um, so, yeah, I have to say no to lots of things. Um, and then like anything, when you're scheduling stuff in, you know, if you've got a full-time job. So my friend David Robertson, who's a Canadian writer, he has five children and loads of books coming out and is wildly successful. And uh, yeah, for him, he talks to me about this. Uh, and it's it's a challenge. It's a balance, you know. How much can he schedule in? How much does he have to say no to? Um, he needs to be able to earn enough. And so, you know, making, going to do things um, where he's going to be selling copies of his books or where he's being paid to go, like it's hard for him to say no to those things. Um, at the same time, he has to make sure he help, he carves out time for his writing and he carves out time for his five children. Um, and so I really connect with him when we talk about um, how, to, how to manage it all. And I listen to his advice and I read, you know, James Clear online, I really like his way of looking at things uh, about how to manage time and having good habits around stuff. Um, so yes, it's very easy to get overwhelmed, but some of that stuff is, you know, further down on the list. So when I get to it, I enjoy it. And when I don't get to it, I don't worry about it too much. That was a very long answer. Sorry. I, as you can see, uh, it's, a, it's something that I think about and I try to try to manage. No, I love that. Uh, uh, sorry, I had a bit of a technical issue. I think the storm is knocking out my internet a little bit. Um, no, it's it, that's one thing that I hear a lot from from writers who are on the upswing. You know, how do I manage my time? Social media can be such a time suck. Thinking about marketing can be so inundating. So how mm -hmm. how do you juggle it? And and it really can push people, especially people who are not naturally. Well, and I think again, like like Bev is mentioning here that it's a balancing act. Like I kind of don't really believe in balance. I think you're always overbalanced one way or the other way. And that's okay. And so there was a couple years where I spent a lot of time on social media mm. and learning about these things and uh, setting up my website and I didn't spend enough time on my writing and you know, like and it felt like I was spending too much time on it. And now like I've taken Facebook off my phone, I barely check in, I haven't posted for, for weeks, I don't really care. Um, you know, so I've gone too far the other way probably <laughs> from the point of view my publishers will be like, uh, hello. Um so you know, it's a it is a balancing act. And sometimes you'll be in your life where you're really invested in learning about those things. It's part of the job. And sometimes you really don't want to and you have to just turn it off and work on a new book. And thank you very much for the advice about B2. She does take magnesium, but I will look at B2. Donna, thank you. Um, I think the, the thing that I'm really taking away from this talk today is this idea of sort of the long view. Um, I think people get very wrapped up in what do I do now and what do I do next? I think listening to Alice from this kind of more holistic career wide lens, it's more of an ebb and flow. There are seasons mm -hmm. for writing, there are seasons for marketing, there are seasons for thinking about audience, there are seasons for thinking creatively, there are seasons for revision, there are seasons for not writing because you're doing other yeah. stuff. And, and this is, I mean, because I live with another writer, I have to, I have to balance it around his writing life. So he, as the writer who is more successful, I have to balance it around what works and what's useful for him. And so I know that he's about to go more into the writing part of his process. And so it's much easier for me to say no to pretty much everything because I know right now the priority in our household is that he is working on a new book. And that's not because he's a man, it's because of his seniority as a writer um, uh, in terms of where he needs to be and the support he needs. But then there has been two years over the last two years where he has been in a more research phase mm -hmm. and so been much more available um, when I've needed him with the children. But I know the three years before that, it was really difficult in terms of me being able to do all the things I wanted to do because 
I had to prioritize uh, our family life and looking after looking after the children uh, because that was where things were at and that was the age they were at. So that, that's exactly what you're saying about seasons. There's just times in life where, you know, if your kids are young or you're caring for an elderly or a sick person in your life or um, something comes up that requires that that has to be the priority that it's okay that, that that season passes and you're not you're not getting stuff done but that doesn't mean that I can't be reading as much as I always mm. read and I can't be writing my thousand words even if I don't have time to do the editorial work that would mean that book moves to publication um or you know if you're at a stage where you're submitting then part of every week would need to be researching where to submit mm -hmm. and uh who you're sending out to and like as a mary's you know a mary's um course talks about like what steps do you need to take for the next bit of your career so i do have times where i look overall okay this is the next three months ahead what are the key things i want to work on what's going to be possible what do I have to let go? And this is the next six months and this is the next year. Mm. Um, okay, what do I need to educate myself on? And uh, what do I want to educate myself on? And so I'm always questing to do better. Uh, and I think there's a lot that I could learn and do better. And I'm also respectful of the fact that lots of people who are midless like me, like it doesn't work out. Like it isn't it isn't going to, it's no guarantee, there's no guarantee that any publisher is going to buy my next book, none at all, which I'm sorry if it's depressing for those of you who look and see, okay, she's been published in 34 countries, she's got 10 books, four more books to come, and there's no guarantee she's going to get the next book published, but that's the reality of it for me. Um, and like these books are successful. Parent Magazine chose this one as their, one of their top 15 books of the year. I've just been on tour with it. There is no guarantee that anyone's publishing my next book. And that's what this is like but it's like that for any artist it's like that for any musician it's like that for any um uh, contemporary dancer it's like that for anyone who makes movies unless you're like stellar uh in terms of financial success for your publishers then uh, i'm just really super grateful for the fact that i get to spend time doing the thing i most love which is writing but i'm hoping that all of you get to do that regardless of whether you end up publishing and making any money at it you can you make the time to do that piece? Because that piece is still the most important piece um, for me. I, I love this because I think it will encourage the people watching and listening to take some of the pressure off and to treat themselves with a little more kindness, um, which is, we all need it, you know? And I think sometimes we are very, very hard on ourselves in in this whole process and we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and i think this reminder from you you know i see you you're so successful multi-published you know star star stars in your eyes um that it's still you know you have this attitude of like you know i get to do what i love today tomorrow's never promised <laughs> do you like that star, star, star. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's what it feels like. My children, when I walk in, are just so starstruck. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mommy, um, can you wipe my butt? Yeah. That's, what I, that's, yeah, I know, that's yeah. the, the season of life that I'm in. Lee is asking if I recommend submitting to a publisher directly or waiting to find an agent first for new authors. So it depends who you're, who you're sending to. Um, there are publishers in Canada um, who I know are looking for to work and you don't need to have an agent so you basically have to sort of look at what type sorry i'm just getting my charger up because my computer's gonna die um so you um it, it depends which publisher you're aiming for and it depends what type of book you are writing so um what i always do is i actually um although i work for children's book insider before i worked for them i actually read them and then it was because i read them that i approached them to say i would like to work for you um and so uh children's book insider do a very good like i'm a member still and they send out like a a summation of uh children's publishers and YA publishers and agents who are looking for work. Um, and I'm sure there are others who do that in the States. I know that in Saskatchewan, we have the Saskatchewan Writers Guild that is always sending out like call outs for publishers and for agents. Uh, although we don't have any agents in Saskatchewan, so it's mainly publishers uh, and they tend to do it countrywide. Um, in Canada, 
we have like a list of agents and a list of publishers and you probably have the same thing in the states probably in tel aviv too you probably have writers groups hi tel aviv um so uh, th uh wherever you are there will be a place where you can locate the type of information that will let you know per publisher or per agent what they prefer and so let's say um you've written a middle grade book and it has like real uh, commercial pull you think like it's the sort of book that's going to connect with tons of readers and you feel like it's it's going to be the sort of thing that a big publisher might really go for well then you're looking for agented representation like I've got, sorry if i put the computer here then it doesn't wobble i move my hands so much when i'm talking um but let's say you've written a book um that's that's going to connect with like a smaller audience maybe it's a book that's for uh, teenagers about hockey right um and very local hockey so saskatchewan based hockey well then you might be looking at a saskatchewan publisher then you wouldn't need an agent uh because you uh, would be able to submit directly and you would look at that publisher's um submission policies and you would see oh you know you can you can send an unsolicited submission um if you're deciding to self-publish you don't need an agent at all um although if your self-published book sells lots and lots and lots of copies you might then want to reach out to an agent to say you know this book has done really well uh i self-published it these are my numbers um here is a, a submission for my next book do you think you'd like to represent me so it's it's a complicated um question yeah that like the whole social media, you know, author platform thing, it's part of the job to figure it out. And it's book by book too. So um, it may be that one book uh, isn't, um, isn't finding an agent and you might want to start looking at smaller publishers um, or more local publishers or uh, publishing it yourself because maybe the agent is just not seeing what you're seeing in your book um it may be that you just need to do more work and that the book isn't ready for publication um it may be that you want to reach out to a freelance editor like mary um which i have done uh with books that i haven't sent to my agent i don't send everything i write to my agent which is the other piece uh and i don't reach out to publishers around her either i just Oh, my coffee's gone. Um, <laughs> Internet's uh, interviews over. Really disappointing. I know that sucks. Um, so yeah, it's a question by question piece, but staying abreast of um, what agents are looking for, which CBI is good at. But again, this is not just a shout out for CBI. This is just like finding a place where you you trust a resource where you trust. I just happen to know that CBI was the one I trusted. Um, so going to um, the word is not author conventions, but the word escapes me. Uh, writing conferences. Because I've been up since four o'clock this morning. Writers hmm? conferences. Writing conferences. Right, going to a writing conference and, you know, thinking, you know, this agent is actually, I really like what they're saying. Um, or, you know, this publisher doesn't need agents. I'm going to submit directly to them. Um, and then, you know, if the journey goes well, then I'll connect with an agent later. So it, it's, a, it's a step by step process, like all of it, right? Yeah. Um, so I hope that sort of helps. No, and I actually recommend uh, a bunch of resources. If you, I'll, I'll type it here. Um, let me just pull up on my website i have a page of resources for writers that i like to recommend a oh, lot yeah. of um a lot of different websites and books that cover um i'll put it i'll paste it in the chat so these are not clickable but you may be able to copy and paste um so yeah resources for writers uh you can also get it yeah. from kidlit.com i have a lot of resources that i recommend um i recommend submitting to agents and publishers that take unagented submissions simultaneously mm -hmm. there's very little risk that you're going to overlap and publishing takes so long that you sort of want to get out there um you can do that it's not completely against the rules it's just uh, a, a strategy that i recommend i do also have the manuscript submission blueprint which covers this topic in about 10 hours of video content uh very comprehensive if you want to do a deep dive into that topic um but yeah i think we are over time uh i love yep. sorry questions. Very i've loved your wisdom alice Thank you so much. I'm curious. Uh, right, recommending go, yeah. <laughs> Picture Book Summit as an online writing conference. Uh, for sure, 
children's write-on oh, right, right yeah. con is also another uh, online writing conference. So it doesn't take as many resources to travel there. There are so many online opportunities now um, that you can take advantage of uh, in your in your pajamas, which is which is my criteria for <laughs> for doing a new writing yeah. opportunity. Um, as far as webinars coming up for me, you can join me August third for a paid uh, query webinar that does include a critique of your query letter um, on August 17th for a writing irresistible voice webinar and uh, on September 7th for writing interiority, which is sort of the, the access to character piece. So that's mine if you want to. That's the one I always, that, yeah, that, that I always find yeah. really hard. Yeah, it's it's a, a great tool, but a lot of people don't quite know how, how to use it. So we'll we'll chat about all that. And Alice, do you have any big things coming up for you that people can where people can find you oh i was just gonna have one last thing to just say to take it seriously take it seriously that writing is important to you um and and make sure the people around you know to take it seriously it it um it may be years before uh, it starts to sound serious in terms of what other people think you know it might be years and years before before you get published it could be next week you don't no, um, but take it seriously regardless of what the outside world thinks of you as a writer. Um, then what's coming up for me? Uh, <laughs> I guess I have a book coming out in spring with Orca, uh, which I'm excited about, called World's Worst Parrot. I've had two books out just this May. Um, so one was called Always Smile about Carly Allison, nonfiction, and then, yeah, Polly Diamond book two. Um, and then that's it for me. I'm just writing and looking after all the children. Yeah, thank you very much, all of you. I will say goodbye and leave Mary just to wrap everything up. I will mute and uh, close off my video right, screen Alice, so that you can thank finish you up with so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I loved it. I apologize for any kind of uh, technical difficulties, things cutting in and out a little bit. I think uh, my internet might have might have had uh, some kind of storm impact on it. But yes, so uh, check out Alice's website. Uh, and thank you so much for joining me for this interview uh, series. I'm going to continue to do interviews. And like I said, I have webinars coming up uh, from the Kidlit website. You can also uh, check out the webinars and events tab. I'm going to put that, that um that link in the chat if you would like um to join me again for we have query webinars coming up voice interiority tons of good stuff uh more interviews this fall and uh again thank you so much for spending your saturday morning with me if you want to watch this again if you missed any part of it you'll get a replay uh link in your email shortly and uh thank you everyone have a wonderful rest of your weekend bye <laughs>